Well, thanks everybody. Okay, so now, uh, with, just to begin, so we're gonna, we're gonna launch into this uh, case study and talk a little bit about how you use uh, data science and analytics to be able to make data-driven decisions. Uh, but to begin, let me just share with you a couple of my opening thoughts. This is an opportunity for, for just to share some of the things that I find interesting that's happening in the field right now. Um, one is certainly this concept, you know, that data is the new oil, right? I think we've all sort of heard that, you know, kind of heard that meme or maybe seen it. But what I like is kind of the next line behind that, which is we need to find it, extract it, refine it, distribute it, and monetize it, right? So for me, this is what takes, you know, data and analytics out of a kind of a technical realm and moves it squarely into a business and a strategy realm. And then a topic that I don't think that we hear enough about. Let me just share this photo. I know it's a little fuzzy, a little hard to see, but this is a photo from a uh, data mining conference held last year in Beijing with over 4,000 people in attendance to uh, talk about latest topics uh, you know, around data mining. You know, for me this says, you know, a lot of organizations are struggling with the imperative internally whether or not this is the time to launch into to data and analytics. And I say not only is it time for your company or even time for your industry, but really as we look at our economy as a whole, you know, that this is really about global competitiveness, right? That it's we don't have the luxury of this stuff saying, I don't think we're gonna worry about all that data science stuff, right? So just just a couple of things there. Um, and also at this point, I think this class is really, um, you know, sort of very familiar with, but that the idea of what we're even talking about when we talk about data has just absolutely exploded, right? Everything from structured data to unstructured data like video feeds. For me though, I have a lot of passion about how data and analytics affects the relationship that we have with customers. And so I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I think this is a topic around customer experience that your class has had some, uh, had some exposure to. But I do want to share some highlights because I think it sets a good stage for the industry that we're going to be talking about. My main point is that expectations have changed and I think you'll, I think you'll know why. Really quick pop quiz. Hey, what's this woman doing? Any, any idea? Getting a cow, oh my God, it's like so old school, right? Because this woman is also getting a cab, right? And so it's not about, and I know that you've talked about um, Uber in this class, and you've talked about other technologies. For me, it's not about the technology, it's not about the analytics, it's not about all the things that are powered on the back end, but it really is about this customer experience, right? This is what it's all about, and this is one of the reasons to me why it is so profound and so different. Here's a zoomed in shot of the customer experience when you climb into, a, a climb into most taxis in New York City. Uh, and then uh, followed up by the Uber customer experience when you hop in. I don't, now, I ride Uber. Cars are usually not that nice. <laughs> but I think quite, uh, you know, it still tells us it's, it's a, a, a pretty clear, uh, pretty clear uh, comparison. All right. I want to also just uh, highlight a few things from Amazon. So uh, for those of you who don't have the luxury of uh, you know, shopping Amazon when they first uh, rolled out, this is the very first Amazon.com homepage. <laughs> Welcome to it. Uh, obviously has changed just a little bit over the years. And a lot of the Amazon story uh, has been about you know, the back end and how powerful their supply chain is and how important logistics are to their overall success, which is obviously the case, right? It, and, and based on the backbone that Amazon has created, both physical and on the electronic side, you know, just has spun off a tremendous amount of services uh, and, and innovations. And I think that one of the things for me, though, that's most compelling about this Amazon story is, you know, they just, they just don't stop. You know, they just continue to change, continue to innovate, driven by data. Anybody know what this is? Uh, I think, Corey, you're nodding your head. What's, what's that? Yes, that's a dash button, and that's exactly what it does. And, and, and not only transmit data, so this is customized to your account and to your particular shopping preferences. And you push that little button, that's a, a little magnet that sticks to your, uh, to your washing machine, and your next shipment of, uh, of Tide detergent is going to be shipped out automatically to your house. So no need to even get on your phone, no need to log into your computer. You just 
you just touch that little button and, and off comes the next shipment, right? So what does that mean from a customer experience? I mean, like, just think about what it took to be able to get to that insight, right? That people, would, that this would be hugely convenient, you know, to even know what kinds of products to offer. Like, how would you even, like, where would you even go with something like this? All on the back end, you know, powered by data and analytics. I think, I don't know if you guys, have, have everybody seen here, on, here in this room, have, have you all been to this space here for Amazon? All right, you need to go. Now, Amazon has gone full circle. They have actually created a bricks and mortar presence. So this is actually the Amazon, I'll put it in quotes, store, uh, located at the ASU, ASUC Student Union. So there's actually, the, it's empty in this picture, but behind that desk, there are actual real live humans, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, who actually work there. And that they, will, they are there to be able to uh, offer, offer support and assistance. Um, one of the things that they do is they make returns really super simple. You don't even need the box. You just take, you can just take that, you know, that blender that didn't quite work, show up, hand it to them over the counter, and off it goes on its way back to Amazon, right? I mean, how profound in terms of, you know, just thinking about the customer experience and the ability to completely turn that on its head. And then also for you, now you're not exactly the same audience, but if you think about um, some of the challenges, if you're in college and you're, and you're gonna shop with Amazon, what's, what are maybe one or two of the hesitancies or one or two of the obstacles that you'd have if you were gonna shop with Amazon? Like what's one of the problems? Uh, is that the Ben? Oh, why is it hard to send it to your dorm room? Exactly. So that's probably, I mean, that's probably item number one, right? It's like it's actually hard to reach, you know, college students. As you can see, and you can't see the picture very well, but those big numbered areas, one, two, three, four, five, six, part of the Amazon locker system, right? So, so students can actually show up, have, have packages delivered right there, and have the convenience of being able to, to receive it. Uh, and then one last, and if that wasn't enough, one last piece of the story. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I know that I'm kind of impatient, but today's college student, even more so, right? It's like, what? Wait till tomorrow. I mean, tomorrow, I might not need it by tomorrow. I need it right now. So based on that back end, I can now designate this location, and I can choose from, quite literally, and I've done this because I, I also live in Berkeley, literally millions of items in Amazon's distribution system can be shipped the very same day, right? So I can, I, can, I can order it now from my phone, and I can go probably in a couple hours be able to pick it up you know, within, this, within, this Amazon, uh, within this Amazon space. Right? Just a tremendous, so for a company that we already know as an innovator, they've just completely you know, taken that to a, a whole new level with, with their customer experience. Uh, I'm not going to dwell uh, at length on, on Starbucks, but Starbucks clearly doing the same thing. Uh, and if you haven't yet used their mobile app to make a purchase, um, particularly at, a, you know, at one of the Starbucks stores, I suggest you do it just from the understanding of what that experience is. And then in this class, to think about what kind of data do you need on the back end, and, and to do things like um, to serve up my previous orders. Um, I can also, I don't know if it shows here, I can also order in advance so that by the time I arrive at the store, that cup of coffee and the scone is gonna be waiting for me. What has to happen in the back end to be able to, to serve up that kind of experience? So in this age of the customer, you know, it is about, I mean, and, and so now think about it. I mean, higher expectations, if I can push a button on my washing machine <laughs> and I can use my phone to get a ride and I can have millions of goods shipped to me in a course of, you know, a course of hours, I mean, that now shapes every thought I have about working with companies, right? It's just my expectations are now completely different from what they were, what they were before. So now, take for a minute, think about your bank, <laughs> right? Okay, so don't, don't look at the slide yet, but just think about your bank. Uh, how many people, let's just do a quick poll, how many people feel like their bank has brought Uber-like convenience uh, to, their, to their typical day? How many people's bank is, you say, is on par with Uber? What, nobody, maybe one-ish? 
<laughs> right? So clearly financial services is, uh, yeah, that was a little bit of a trick question. Uh, but financial services is struggling, although you can just see from this quick landscape, there are hundreds of companies in the fintech space who are trying to revolutionize what is happening in financial services, trying to look at the kind of customer experience being delivered by the Amazons and the Ubers and the Starbucks of the world and looking at this across payments and across lending and retail banking and then some more, more specific verticals. So that just kind of gives you, you know, this is, this is going to be a discussion, but this all kind of gives you the background now to think about your role um, as, a, you know, as a leader in strategy uh, and, um, and, and customer experience. So, so now what I want to do is I want to shift gears um, and so move from talking about um, that as background and, and talk about a specific, uh, some, a specific case. So one thing I think that you need to know about uh, the banking industry is that clearly, I think this slide uh, kind of uh, covers the, the key points here and I'm going to get your feedback as well. So first of all, just some of the challenges. As we start, we're going to look at data in just a minute, but I want you to have these challenges in mind. So one is consumer trust, right? So now, obviously, after the kind of global, uh, global meltdown of you know, 2008, um, banking industry and consumer trust was at an all-time low. Um, that has started to recover, but still, there's a long way to go. And it really gets down to, if you ask consumers, do you trust your bank? Um, yeah, they're starting to say yes, but there's still some, there's still some obstacles there. Regulatory issues are probably the number one driver uh, behind uh, uh, strategy issues in the industry. So it's not at this point about customer experience, it's not about profit maximization, it's mostly about managing compliance, and that's, we're going to sort of talk about that. Uh, and, then, uh, and then last but not least, you know, I did show you that, that list of the hundred some odd companies who are trying to disrupt everything, right? Everything from retail banking to lending to, to what have you. So uh, first question, I guess I ask, I say winners will need to be agile and increasingly customer cent cent <coughs> excuse me, centric. Uh, believe it or not, a lot of bank executives don't really, don't really believe that statement. They don't necessarily feel that to win, that what they have to do is be uh, customer centered. Uh, they've got other, they, they think that there's other things that are more important. So let me ask you, let's, let's try to, let's start to put ourselves in the bank, on uh, the bank mindset. Uh, let's make the case for why this statement is wrong. So why, so no, you don't actually have to be all agile and customer, you know, customer centric. What's the argument for why this is not actually, uh, not actually the case? Corey. Because of what you said earlier about regulatory reform. Right? Yeah. So from a bank perspective, I'm paying attention to the regulation all day because I know there's always going to be new regulation. Yeah. Customers, I mean, sure, yeah, like as long as I have a stable deposit base, I'm okay, but really, <laughs> Yeah, okay, that's a, that's a core one. Anybody else add to that? So why else is this not so, uh, read. Yeah, exactly. You know, you get, I mean, banks, does, just extend on that, you know, you want, and if you do a lot of consumer research in this, you know, customers want to know that their money is safe, right? They want it to, to be dependable. So, uh, yeah, I don't want all this crazy change. Uh, Andrew. Uh, barriers to entry are incredibly high. Yeah. Do you have any idea, Andrew, of what some of those barriers are? I mean, just to get a bank charge. You know, <laughs> Uh, that's a that's the huge one, right? So in the United States, as in many countries around the world, you have to you have to be chartered by the by the government. It's very difficult to get that charter, and so you know what? It's kind of tough to open up as a bank. So yet another reason that we don't need to be too worried about being agile and customer focused. We have our bank charter. Uh, we have a stable product. We're keeping our regulators happy. All sounds pretty good. Uh, any other any other observations here and sort of poking holes in this kind of agile, innovative, uh, oh, that all that innovative stuff? I, know, I think that kind of gets you. That sort of get, we're getting that we're getting that mindset going, which I think is the is the key. Now, again, just for balance, now here's the other side of the equation, right? This is us in the in the customer, you know, that that customer on the phone. And so what we're going to do is um, just based on the time, I'm going to just move and and sort of get to uh, looking at some of the some of the data. 
So now in this case discussion, I really want you to think about being that, uh, first of all, your organization is Capital One. Um, so you're a you know, global leader in financial services, but in particular today we're going to be talking about the credit card business. So that's kind of the, that's your frame of, of reference is thinking about credit cards. Quick question, anybody have a Capital One credit card? Uh, if you look around, it's actually almost everybody in this room has a Capital One credit card, so that's good. It makes sense. They're one of the top issuers in the world, right? So, so that's, that's um, all right, so now let's get, into the, let's get into this case discussion. You know what your role is. Let's actually, uh, let's actually move forward. So the first piece, of, uh, first piece of background, so we're going to be looking at data from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. This is the primary industry regulator for the banking industry. Uh, everything from banking accounts to credit cards, which we're focusing on, to mortgage and others. And a variety of different types of institutions. And we're going to be talking about uh, large banks, but it also includes uh, credit unions, fintech companies, mortgage, payday lenders, and a variety of others. Here's the first piece of data. So again, you're Capital One. Feel free to make notes as you, as you go along. Um, this is just a, a quick snapshot of, um, of major fines that have been issued in the, uh, in the industry. And so uh, you see, uh, first thing on the land, first of all, can everybody see, everybody read this okay? Okay, great. So your Capital One, your, your, your big fine was uh, $210 million. Um, but let me just give you a, another sense of it. Discover, American Express, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Aquin uh, weighing in at the biggest regulatory fine probably in history in financial services at a $2.1 billion price tag, right? So $2.1 billion. This really underscores for the entire industry like why this set of issues is so important, right? And this is just the latest snapshot. I mean, first thing that we can see again in terms of some of the data, we see that um, that uh, fines are you know have been steadily increasing. And then just a little quick snapshot, uh, you know, sixty million dollars in fines and penalties. This was this the last uh, bar here is 2014, but last quarter uh, still sixty million dollars in fines and penalties, right? So uh, the first thing, you know, I think the first thing that we see is, uh, well, actually, I don't know. What is that? What do those first couple of data points tell you? Any, any sort of initial reaction as the strategic planner? Like, what do you see those numbers? What are some of your first, uh, what are some of your first reactions? Uh, Bruce? Yeah, so as an organization, we're going we're, we're gonna to become more risk averse. So whatever strategy or, or new initiative we come up with, we've got to take that into consideration. Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great observation. What else? What else do you see from that? Uh, you don't have a name tag. Carl. Carl. Hey, Carl. Uh, we need to get better at covering our tracks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's really tough to do because you know, that's a good point. And, and, and here's why. Because the bank examiners actually send people into your offices and they go through everything, right? They tear everything apart. They talk to everyone. They gather data. And basically, they can just keep asking for more and more and more and more and more data. So if there's anything that seems like it's not totally clear, they're just going to ask for more data, right? So that's just a part of how they, of how they operate. But good idea. Interesting thinking. <laughs> Anything else? Any other sort of initial observations here as we start to think about this? Uh, as we start to think about this data, right? And, and also, I'm going to re remind you, as you know, in our strategic planning role, you know, these, some of these charts and graphs have been produced by our data scientist team, right? So they're actually they've got a lot of data. Uh, they've been able to kind of cut a few things. We've asked for a few for a few pictures here, but we can always ask them to go back and do a deeper dive. There's all there's other things that we can have them do, you know, as we as we go along. And the, the, the this source of um, uh, right here, just sort of enforcement. There's actually not a lot of data here, but as you can see, it starts to it kind of starts to get us on the right on the right track. Now, sort of on the flip side, just for balance, because we are not. Uh, compliance. We are strategic planning, so there's a lot of other factors. One of them is, you know, we are responsible for driving a positive customer experience, and so this just kind of gives you a couple of industry analysts talking about, uh, on the positive side, if you address uh, customer experience in a positive way, you know what? You can actually do a couple of things. You could, first of all, the total revenue. Uh, potential for your organization. This was this was some research done by two different analyst firms uh, for specifically for card issuers, and and one came up with a, an estimate of uh, a net impact of, of 246 million dollars that the top issuer that a that a top issuer could make. So incremental revenue by being a customer experience leader. 
Uh, and, and the way that that was sort of broken out was by reducing churn, by driving additional purchases, and by uh, positive word of mouth, right? So this is sort of the other side of the coin. It's not just about regulation and compliance. Um, so let's go. Uh, one other thing I wanted to point out is that while the, uh, the data set for consumer complaints, so basically any consumer in the United States uh, can go to, uh, uh, to the CFPB's website and file a complaint, right? So that's basically how it works. Um, and, and there are therefore thousands of companies that are listed across all kinds of different areas. But what's interesting, I think, and, and again, from that kind of narrowing perspective from a, from a data scientist, is that while there's thousands of companies that I could look at, you know, and, and this is work that, that my company actually did, we said, well, yeah, you know, there's thousands of companies, but how does it, you know, how does it concentrate? Like, how does it, how does it come together? Actually, the top 15 companies really account, you know, for the case of mortgage, accounts for 81% of all, of all the complaints, right? For, for credit card, 94% of all the consumer complaints come down to just 15, you know, just 15 companies, right? So there's a high concentration of complaints for the top, uh, for the top issuers. All right, so here's the first, you know, here's the first set of now real complaint data that you're seeing, okay? So uh, this is just a, uh, just a trend line of total complaints in, uh, in, in, in the industry. So, and this is over the course from November 2011 through, so this is about two years of, of data here. Um, over 25,000 complaints. Um, what do you first see, Greg? So I was wondering, uh, to what extent does the complaint database suffer from some kind of selection bias? I mean, we see that, um, you know, if you were to figure out which airline offers the worst service, you know, United would show up at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. Spirit would be kind of, you know, lower down, mm -hmm. uh, purely because, you know, people expect crappy service from Spirit. So yeah. They don't complain. Yeah. Or another example that we talked about in class is that, you know, complaints related to fire code violations frequently occur in those neighborhoods that have the least amount of fire code violations. Basically, yeah. Yeah. you know, high income yeah. uh, people who are, you know, more attentive to these things yeah. as opposed to the poor neighborhoods that actually have the violations. Yeah, yeah. Hey, that's a great question. That's our, so our CEO just asked that question to strategic planning. Uh, so how do you respond to that? Is it, who even, why should we even look at this data? There's tons of, isn't there just like a ton of selection bias? Why would why should we why, why, you're you've now made you're you're making this presentation why should we still look at this data even though that's the case or maybe not I mean, maybe you agree maybe you're like oh I'll, uh, kill the presentation we're done <laughs> how, how do you respond to that well I would respond because well hold on, no you can't respond that's uh, <laughs> Nikhil so what else is that I mean, yeah what else can you look at. Okay, yeah, I mean, this is kind of what we, this is kind of like what we have, right? So that's, so that could be one argument. So that's, so let, let, let's hold on to that. Okay, yeah, uh, because. Uh, the regulatory agency is gonna make a decision just based on the filed complaint, so probably that's the. There is that, and, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll go through to show this, but yes, actually the regulators, this is the data that they're actually looking at. So kind of like flaws and all, this is what they're using. This is what they're looking at. This is how they're deciding who to take to court, and this is how they decided who to who to find two billion dollars, right? So it's kind of like, yeah, there's some inherent there's, and this is the debate, honestly, that's been going on in the industry is to say, God, with all these issues, you know, how is it? And one other one, uh, if we actually get to, uh, I'm going to skip ahead to, uh, let's see, to this one, and I'll, I'll go back. But look at, if you look at this data, um, I ask this question. There's a pitfall to looking at the total number of complaints. Now, Gregory, you, our CEO mentioned a couple of them, but there's a couple others. I mean, what's the issue with looking at the total number? Of, so, so here's the data, by the way. So here's Capital One on this. Here's Capital One, City, GE, Wells Fargo. What's the problem with just looking at the total number of complaints? Thank you. Should be looked at proportional to number of cars issued. Yes, that is the that is the key thing. There's no scale here. There's no you know so there's no perspective, which means 
Well, of course, we would expect the largest banks to have the most number of <laughs> complaints, right? Like that, if all things being equal, just based on the size, you know, just based on the size alone, like that's a key, that's a key consideration, right? And again, I think that this, as if we think about our role in as a business manager, as a strategic thinker, this we're just going to be presented with the data and with the charts, and really, it's it's going to look like this, and and it's our job to be able to sort of use that, what I'll call sort of data science thinking to ask these really pointed questions about the data. Let me go back though, because I, I didn't want to pass through, um, I, I want to go back to a couple other things. So, uh, one of the things that, uh, here's another data point, this is just, uh, this is a data point here. So, uh, we have an observation from our data scientists that Capital One and Amex experienced peaks in complaints uh, around the time of their fines. So the blue, uh, the blue line is, is us, that's Capital One. Uh, the green line is, uh, is Amex, and the uh, brown line is Discover. And if you remember that piece of data earlier with uh, how much the fines were, we've just kind of plotted on the, on the charts uh, the fines, right? So this is uh, the, our complaints for credit card plotted against the, um, the, uh, uh, the fines paid. Um, let me just pause there. Useful, helpful, any, any observations? What might you say based on this, uh, based on this point, Bruce? You know, if it, were, if, if it were a $210 million fine because we ran an experiment to understand our customers better and the potential upside was between 246 and 307, mm -hmm. that might actually be net positive for us. If, that were, if, that, if that's the purpose of the complaints. Uh -huh. That's interesting. I mean, it's sort of saying, well, you know, I mean, maybe, and I think Bruce, I got this right, is, is that, well, yeah, you know, 210 million might be the cost of doing business, but maybe there's more of an upside, and so you, is that sort of where you're going with that? If that's what it took to get the, the data, that's the, the cost of that experiment. Yeah, okay, so, so if, you, if you had to sort of figure that out, you know, I think the only, the only challenge there is, well, yeah, but what if you were Aquin and your fine was two point? What if you paid that and you got two point one billion dollars, right? So that's a little bit, a little bit of a, of a challenge there. This, this data. Any other observations? Again, you've been presented with it. You're kind of betting it. Does it any other, any other? What would you rate? To just pass on. I don't really think that's very important. Trader. Well, I mean, it's basically saying that this is not measuring service quality, but it's measuring kind of uh, it's, it's, a, it's a focusing illusion. Right, the people who are complaining are complaining because they're reading about it in the paper. So the the, the cause and effect is is backwards. Yeah. So maybe this has actually nothing to do with what's actually happening in our business. That it's all about you know people hear about this complaint database, they go and file a complaint, and again that would be another argument for the bank to actually take no action at all. Right? Just say, well, don't even act on this. this is not really this is not real not real data. Um, so let me go to the next piece of data. <laughs> This is not my day for technology, I'll tell you that. Um, <laughs> it's hard to talk about the data when you can't see it. <laughs> So now, here's a new piece of data. Again, strategic planning, you're looking at all the data, we're trying to be, have decisions you know, made based on data. This is just, this is credit cards. Uh, this is now just an, uh, an allocation of the top 10, we just sort of broken out the top 10 issues for credit cards, okay? So, uh, so I've got billing disputes, interest rate, credit reporting, closing account, identity theft, all the way down to debt protection. So those are the issues for the product. And then what we've done is to add some meaning to this, you know, I, I, our data scientists to add some meaning to this, we've also added the top two companies uh, for that issue, right? So if you look at billing disputes, the company with the most issues is uh, COF, which is Capital One Financial. So they were top in that issue. And then next was Citi. Uh, in interest rate, it was J.P. Morgan and Capital One. Then it was Capital One and Bank of America. That's sort of the, and then all the way down, you can sort of see uh, in basically, and I know it gets a little harder to read there, but um, Capital One is the top bank, they, i.e. they got the most complaints across every single issue, um, you know, throughout the, you know, throughout the spectrum. Of the top 10 issues, they're number one. 
uh, with the exception of interest rate, where they're number two. <coughs> how would you how would you use this data? What is that? Or would you use this data? Does this does this help? Where do you how do you leverage this insight? Yeah, we're not looking at the proportion of the data. Mm -hmm. uh, loan, I mean, these complaints to the volume of loans. <coughs> That would be a great question, right? So, so this data, um, this is not, uh, I think that, I, I don't think that this is scaled. So that's one thing I definitely would want to do is you definitely want to be able to say, okay, yes, but within our portfolio, how does this, there's some things that we might get in terms of product data, loan originations, credit card balances. There's more that we could bring into this. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so in service, we'll typically control for a number of contacts. <coughs> Their contacts based on usage, and we call it case rate. So it's mm -hmm. a, I don't know, a ratio of contacts for pegging it to something else, which could be volume of customers, volume of credit, volume of something else. Yeah, and I think that's a great point because what this so right now I'm just talking about external regulatory data, right? But this isn't the only data in the world, right? There's all kinds of things that you're using internally, all of your internal metrics. So how do we start to like matrix or, or bring in some of that data to be able to make these more rich for our particular organization? Uh, Mahul, was there? A, you have Mahul. Yeah. Mahul? Um, I think a couple of things. One was I'd be curious to see what changes there were from the previous year. <laughs> That's a great idea because this is all. This is again. This is just one. Uh, oh, let's see. Actually, this is uh, this is a year. So yeah. So you're right. So exactly. What were the prior years look like? Absolutely. That's a, that's a great. That's a great point. The second thing was just given that you have the top two companies for each issue. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of sizing up your com from a competitive perspective. Is I want to go after this one first, given that this competitor is inching up on me. Or something along those lines. Absolutely. I think that that's a great, I think that that's a great point. And, and that's one of the things that we've always pointed out as a firm about this data. This is the first time ever that you can directly benchmark yourself directly against your competitors, right? And this actually goes down to zip code level. So I could even do that on a market by market basis and say, you know, interesting, they've got a lot of complaints about credit reporting in, in Florida, for example, um, hey, if we're going to kind of position against them, maybe one of the things that we want to talk about is our own strength is just how easy credit reporting is, right? I mean, it just kind of gives you some ideas to kind of fuel some of your, um, some of your information. Um, we then, this data has other cuts to it. So, so one thing that we looked at is the, this, it's sort of like the resolution of the case, you know, so you can, so the case or the complaint can be closed with explanation, closed with monetary relief, closed without relief. There's sort of lots of different ways that, the, that, a, that a complaint can be closed. As a, as a strategic thinker, my, my data science team said, hey, you know what? We think we should really focus on close with monetary relief. Like we think we should probably focus there. Do you guys agree? Would you focus on close with monetary relief? Is that, is that a place that you might start? And if so, I guess that's a leading question. Why? Why do you think data science is saying, hey, start with monetary relief? Uh, Andrew? Well, I mean, it's, let's say you paid someone off, like you brushed it under the rug, and, and like, OK, so is this happening outside of people who are actually complaining about it? Just like, Yeah, that's, I think that is, that's a key. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't even know you're doing Oh, Lars. Um, Lars. It, it also means that the customer incurred financial damages. That's right. So both of both of those reasons, we thought those were that was a pretty good place to pretty good place to look. And so then now we we narrowed in. We said, okay, so just looking at monetary relief, let's recut the issues and say when it's a case of credit card and monetary relief, what are the what are the, the issue drivers there? So the next level down, billing disputes and and interest rates. So okay, so this is what com that consumers complain about most in those circumstances. And so then we said, okay. Show us a new picture. Show us the picture, on one hand, the proportion that we make up as Capital One of all complaints, and the proportion when there's a billing dispute <coughs> resulting in monetary relief. Right. And wouldn't you want to, wouldn't you want to match the, CF, the um, uh, CFPB complaints with your internal complaints? Because the only time you go to the CFPB uh, is if you fail to get a resolution internally. Right, so you know, one of the things that uh, they found at eBay, for instance, mm -hmm. was that um, if you're trying to predict the likelihood of an unsatisfactory, unsatisfactory customer experience, the, the ratings that the seller has 
are actually non-predictive. Mm -hmm. And that's because most of the unsatisfied customers will contact the seller first mm -hmm. and threaten to leave a bad rating. And, and that usually does the trick. And so the, the guys who provide the most, the, the worst service uh, actually don't have the worst um, ratings mm -hmm. because that's sort of a, 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 a that's sort of a last gasp uh, measure. So, you know, what you presumably want to do is see, you know, what's the, the complaint funnel? Uh, and, you know, it could well be that those who have lower CFPB complaint scores actually have much higher customer dissatisfaction. It's just that there's a way to get them intercepted uh, before they make it to the seats. I think that's exactly, I, th I mean, I think that's exactly on the money. And that, and just to sort of say that is, well, again, why are we only just looking at the end of the line in terms of complaints, right? We know that that's sort of like the absolute sort of worst case scenario. What in our organization could we use as an early warning signal? Like that's sort of how we thought about it. So there are going to be emails that the customer sent. There's going to be calls that they made. Maybe there's actually, and, and we did sort of a big data analysis of transactions. Maybe there's certain types of transactions that are highly correlated with dissatisfaction. And in fact, there were, there were a couple. Uh, one was around uh, wire transfers and having to, uh, the hassle of being able to, having to go into a branch to be able to do a wire transfer. The other was a requirement to have uh, two forms of identification, including a current, uh, a current driver's license, even if the banker knew you, and even if you'd been banking there for 15 years, and even if your driver's license was expired, but it was obviously still you, right? These are all things that kind of made you dissatisfied. And so there were ways to be able to look at some of that transactional data and, and to be able to put some of this in, in context. Uh, just kind of going through um, quickly, so one of the things that we've done is to try to look for some of the patterns along these lines, right? So this was one that we saw in terms of uh, interest rates. So first of all, just, just the mess. I mean, this is really sort of like the spaghetti that you normally see, right? And this is just, hey, give me those top issues um, for Citibank and let me see it over time and let me just see kind of like what comes out. I mean, the easy answer is not a lot comes out and it really is the data science I think is the is the making simple of things that's otherwise very complex. But we decided to focus in on that interest rate issue. Why? Because it was related to monetary relief and it was one of the top issues, right? So we looked at interest rates. But what we did, sort of to Greg's point, is we actually went out and did um, text analytics of unstructured text data that we received through social media. We said, you know, people are probably tweeting about this. They're, like, they're not just filing regulatory complaints, they're actually tweeting about it too. So the yellow line is the complaint line, and the, in this case, the, the red line is the social media, you know, kind of the social media chatter. And admittedly, from a data science perspective, you know, this is like the, this is like the poster child, or at least like the perfect relationship, because in this case, social media clearly peaked before consumer complaints, right? But I think it at least makes the argument that by looking at and analyzing social media, something completely different, far afield, could really help you in managing, you know, customer complaints, and in fact, you know, sort of your entire bank strategy around how you serve customers and, and still remain uh, compliant. Just as an example, you're like, well, what did people actually say? Uh, here's, here's just sort of a, here's a sort of a sample. How's this for cynical capitalism? Rang up Citibank to pay off and close my credit card. The lovely lady in the Philippines asked me why, and I said, your interest rate, so that was one of the things we keyed on, is far too high, 21%. She said, well, you know, I'm now willing to lower your rate because you're such a valuable customer. Well, if that's the case, why didn't you drop it earlier, right? So aside from this being just a frustrating circumstance, it's actually uh, against the regulation. Right? So you can't have sort of this, this um, capricious uh, establishment of interest rates and charge you know, two customers that look exactly the same, meet all the same criteria, but give the one rate to one person and a different rate to a different person only based on the fact that one complaint. Right? This is not, under, under the current law, you just can't do that. So this sort of raises all kinds of red flags. And again, by bringing in this new data source, it kind of gives you uh, some insights. Last piece here, I'll just sort of show you, just we did a little bit of a comparison and we said, okay, well, so because we think the regulators, and this was a firm, as a firm, for my firm, we said, we, think, we know regulators are looking at this data 
And if you were looking at this data from a regulator perspective, what would you see? Well, it's like, you know, when we actually mapped out the percentage of complaints, and this was a particular product, this was add-on insurance products. So like you have a credit card and if you ever lose your job, you know, they'll, they'll, pay, your, they'll pay your credit card bill. Like that's what that product is. Both Capital One and Discover, those are the ones that had, you know, $200 million plus fines. And if you had taken this snapshot and if you had looked at, you know, where you stood uh, from this product perspective and looked at this issue, you would see that you were kind of not, you know, kind of not in line with other, with other banks, like sort of like where the other banks are. And so I think it's no coincidence that these were the two, you know, in this snapshot, that these were the two um, uh, banks that, that actually did get fined and that were investigated, right? So it goes back to that earlier question, like, Win, lose, or draw, the data might be bad, but, and I don't think it is bad, but I think it has its limitations, but this is what the regulators are using. Andrew, yes? Yeah. Is this public data? This is totally public data, 100%. Uh, it's, the website is uh, consumerfinance.gov, I think. It's the CFPB uh, slash complaint database. So all this is totally wide open, and not only that, there's actually a really easy to use uh, data visualization tool uh, with that. Uh, Lars? Sorry, were those graphs, was that, before the fine, or were the fines causing those spikes, or those? This is, I think, this is this is at, this is this is basically um, this is a recognition. Uh, well, that's a really good question because I don't know the time. I don't remember the time frame of the underlying data, but I will say I know for sure that um, well. So after the fine, then this bar might be a little bit higher because of complaints that were kind of piled on after the fine, but they were still a big mismatch between where these companies stood and where the rest of the industry stood. That, that's, sort of a, that's sort of the point. That's a really good observation. Because you can't actually tell from this data. Uh, yeah? Are there any banks that did not get fined? Uh, yeah, there's lots of banks, lots of banks that didn't. And in fact, I want to show you just the, just the payoff slide here, which is the impact of this had, right? So now you, you sort of fast forward, hey, thanks to the work of everyone, you know, all the, the great strategic planning group at Capital One, they actually started to look at the organization, and now if we look at year-to-year -year change, the next year, Capital One was actually the leader in reducing the amount of consumer complaints, right? So they actually reduced consumer complaints year-on-year -year by 15%, followed by B of A, Citibank, and Discover, right? So in some cases, it sort of makes sense. Those who were punished most harshly uh, actually, you know, turned it around and actually had a better, you know, sort of had a better, uh, better uptick. Yeah, I mean, one of the ways you can reduce complaints is not to improve service quality, but to, um, you know, target the non-complainers, right? Mm -hmm. So you can identify sort of the, 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 the people that are likely to complain, and you just stay away from them. You know, and so it may not be that you're actually improving service quality, you're just, um, you know, targeting the people that, that are, are uh, yeah, absolutely. Just want to put up with it. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Although I'd say with credit cards, it's very difficult to have different. It's it's hard to offer it to offer anything less than universally, right? So so you could through your marketing be targeting and more likely to be putting the message in front of certain people. But there's not doesn't mean that that anybody who sees that offer uh, and who qualifies has the ability to to accept it. All right, so I think we've kind of, so, so this is just a quick, I'm gonna, we don't unfortunately have time for this chapter of the story, but so what is the answer? You know, so I think that one answer is to be able to look at what we call the voice of the customer and to be able to take this data from lots of different sources and we sort of see it as a continuum, right? So just starting with, hey, you know, maybe we should think about voice of the customer to analyzing the data all the way down to, hey, integrate this kind of data into your ongoing operations, right? So that as you're learning about customer feedback, you really are doing business in a different, in a different way. Um, just just to, to one reason on, I'll just say, one, one of my favorite slides, you know, so if you look at uh, top sites in 2005, you know, uh, Yahoo, MSN, one, if you can still remember, MySpace was the, was the sole social entry, right, uh, 10 years ago. And now, basically, you could say those are all the social sites, but really, I think they're all social, right? I mean, you could, you could honestly argue that they all have social aspects to it. And so we've just made a strong argument for including social media and social media data analytics as part of this overall uh, co co customer uh, understanding. I think that that's the, uh, let me just see if there's any other uh, extreme, uh, let me just, let me just, this has been, for a business audience, it's been high level and strategic, right? 
let me just show you just a little bit under the hood. So, gee, well, how did we actually do this? Like, well, so what actually was kind of at play here? On the consumer complaints side, it's actually fairly straightforward. There's actually, the data is actually well structured. There's really only like 15 fields, um, and, it's, and there's about 900,000 complaints. So that data, you could actually almost just do in Excel, right? So all of the insights, I know you've had other speakers talk to this, but all the insights, all the strategic questions, all the slicing and dicing that have led us to really good discussion, I didn't need like data mining workbench. I didn't have to like program anything in R. There was no Python involved, right? I just thinking about the data to make data-driven decisions, that was one half of the equation, right? The other side, though, admittedly, in looking at the unstructured text data, we did do, uh, this, is, this is kind of a high-level overview of the uh, text analytics. We, we had to figure out products. How do you know what product somebody's talking about? How do you start to categorize that? Can we create themes? Um, in this case, we actually had a recent merger, so we wanted to find merger-related comments. Uh, we wanted to be able to combine all this together, and so we had some heuristic sort of business rules. Um, we wanted to do reporting. We had um, some of these little, we have, the, we have the statistical analysis that we layered in. We had um, uh, natural language programming. So just different components, different techniques, all coming together to make sense out of the text that we then used as a data source to be able to fit these other, other pieces together. I think that that is, uh, I think that's it. Well, thank you very much. I know we had a lot of technical uh, you know, challenges today, but hopefully you know, my purpose was to really get you thinking uh, how to leverage data science in your business decision making. And, and hopefully you know, in, in, our, in our hour today, you, know, you got a little flavor of, of, of how we do that. All right, thanks, thank you.